Let me ask you, if you ever wanted something really, really bad, in fact, fact, you wanted it so bad you would do anything legal to get it. Some of you are thinking, now I've done a couple of illegal things to get something I wanted, but but I mean, you want it really, really bad. We, we have the shopping day we call Black Friday. I don't know why it's called Black Friday. I have no idea where they came up with that. But people will literally camp out, I mean, the night before. And maybe sometimes in cold weather. And they're out there in a line, I mean, I mean that's a long. And they got to wait just to rush in there and to get a discount on, on, on a TV or, or whatever it may be. What motivates us to go to such extremes to get something? I think it could be summed up in one word, and that word would be value. Everybody say value. Value. We obviously value something or someone so much that we'll do whatever it takes to get that. Now, today in this last message in our series called I Have a Name, we're once again exploring the lives of three men who are celebrated and imitated every Christmas as people dress up like them in Christmas plays and programs, the three wise men. Let's get a little bit better acquainted with these three. The term wise men in Matthew comes from the Greek word magos. It's where we get our word magic from. It's also translated magi, and you've always heard the term magi, or kings. So this title was given to priests in the sect of the ancient Persian religions, which was from the east. Today we would call them astrologers. In Jesus' day, astronomy and astrology were part of the same overall studies of science. And so Matthew doesn't say there were three wise men. No, nowhere does it say there were three. We just assume there were three because of the three gifts that were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There could have been six. There could have been ten. But we know there's probably at least three that we focus on. The most important thing about these men is their insatiable desire to pursue Jesus. Let's look at what we can learn from them in Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, these men went to great lengths to pursue Jesus. They just didn't get up uh, early one morning to stand in line uh, on Black Friday. They went to extreme lengths to pursue Jesus. They left their homes and families for, for months, possibly a couple of years. Because as history, uh, Jewish recordings tell us, uh, they, Jesus was probably about two years old when they came to visit him. He wasn't, he wasn't a three-day-old or a day. They didn't just show up like the shepherds did, like we see in the plays that we do in church, because we don't have time to wait two years to, to do that, you know. So, but, but remember, uh, after they left, Herod was so, so mad because they didn't come back and tell him. They were warned by the Holy Spirit not to. He went and had, uh, had, uh, he had soldiers to go to Bethlehem and kill every baby boy of the age of two and down. So we see Jesus was probably about two when they got there. So they, they could have possibly, they could have possibly traveled for a couple of years. They traveled through dangerous territory, sleeping in tents each night instead of their comfortable beds back home, all for one purpose, to make a connection with Jesus. Now we're not going to focus on, on why they pursued Jesus, but why people don't pursue Jesus today. I found that most people don't reach their goals because of roadblocks or challenges that come between them and their goals. And I'm speaking of me too. I th- think the biggest challenge we have in pursuing and, and, and reaching the goals that we have in life are the, are the challenges that come. Sometimes they're like a speed bump. Sometimes they're like a 10-foot wall. And, and, and they, they distract us and discourage us, and we sometimes just give up. So let's ask ourselves. I want to encourage you to ask yourself the question, what's keeping me? from pursuing Jesus. I think of a couple of things. One is a lack of desire. In Psalm 63, 1, we read, Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. Psalm 63, 8 says, My soul follows close. Another translation says, so it follows hard behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Psalm 119, 10 says, With my whole heart I have sought you. O oh Lord, let me not wander from your commandments. Psalm 42, 1 through 2 says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you. P- 
pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living, the living God. Now, these verses are written all by one guy. His name was David. He was a skilled musician. He was the king of a nation. He was a mighty warrior of the day. He's the one that killed Goliath. He had anything and everything that money could buy in his day and time. And yet, the one thing that he desired most was the presence of God. You know why? Because that's where value comes in. Because we will pursue what we value. And, and we can go off in all different directions with that this morning. In, in relationships, your husband, your wife, your uh, family, whatever, we will pursue what we value. I can pretty well determine what you value most in life by looking at your calendar and where you spend most of your time. Now, I know we all got to work. We got to go, go to the office, go to the factory, go whatever. We got to work those hours. But setting that aside, what do you pursue most in life? That's going to tell you what you value most in life. See, too often we replace the presence of God with the perception of God in our relationship with him and even in our church. You say, what does that mean? Well, the word perception or perceive means that uh, we become aware or we know something by means of our senses. What's our senses? That's our feelings. So, so too often we, we, we pursue God with our feelings rather than the presence of God. We have a perception. But guess what? Feelings change. I mean, they change real quick. I mean, they can change just like that. Feelings can change. On your way home and you're driving along and, and the light turns yellow and you're you just can't get through it, and your feelings change immediately. Or you go through the drive-thru, and you give your order, and then you pull up, and you wait, and you wait, and you have an epiphany. It's not a fast food restaurant. It's a slow food restaurant. Okay. So you, th those things can change your feelings just, I mean, immediately like that. Or you ordered it without mayonnaise, like Rose. She does not like mayonnaise. No salad, nothing on it. And... The horror of horrors is when I order no mayonnaise and we get it and drive it. After we've already pulled out and we're driving down the road and she opens it up and it's got mayonnaise on it. And it's my fault. <laughs> Too often we're, we're just happy with the perception of God. Oh, I, I felt good during that song. Well, that's great. Our right, pastor said something that made me laugh. Well, wonderful. But we're so satisfied with the perception of God that we don't suit and pursue the presence of God. See, you're, 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 you're in God's presence it does not change God. God's presence changes us. See, perception doesn't, but presence does. Here's another thing. A lack of knowing that you can. You know, a lot of people surprise me. They don't know they can come to God. They don't know they can experience the presence of God. There have been so many people gone to church in, 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 in a way that it's, there's just a perception, there's a form, there's a religion uh, to go through, there's a liturgy. But other than that, it's just flat. It's flat line. It's dead. I didn't even know you could experience the presence of God. You know what Hebrews 4 says in 14 through 16? So then let us, we have a great high priest that has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he has faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Look at verse 16. So let us, everybody say let us. Everybody say it's talking about me. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace of a gracious God. There will be receive mercy, we'll find grace and help when we need it. You can come before God. See, men through religious institutions are very good at making God hard to reach. They take the place of Jesus as a mediator, and it causes us to be dependent upon them. You, you, you need a good church family because you can't, but not because you can't get to God without it. You need a good church family because it's community, it's accountability, it's discipleship, it's fulfilling the Great Commission. The word community means common unity. And so you need to be in a group where there's a common belief and a, a unity to function because together we're stronger than we are separated. And that's why the Word of God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. We need a good church family. We need community. But that doesn't take you to heaven. That helps you to make it better here on earth. You need a good pastor. Not because you can't get to God without him or her. A pastor is much like a coach. What would a team be like without a coach? A pastor's like a spiritual coach that teaches, that mentors, that corrects sometimes. 
not very often, but, 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 but it helps out and preaches and teaches the word of God so that we grow and become more mature and, and, and we, we organize the troops together and, and everything working together to be an efficient army of the Lord as well as a family of God. But you don't need a pastor to get to heaven. You need a pastor to do better here on earth, to be efficient and be effective. See, you're just one prayer away from God's throne. One prayer away. Don't, don't, don't let a lack of desire or don't let a lack of understanding or knowing that you can't keep you from pursuing Jesus. Well, that's for some people, but it's not for me. Some people can pray and God can touch, but it's not for me. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay. It is for you. Jesus is for you, and you can pursue Jesus, and you can experience the presence of God in your life. Another thing is the fear of commitment. <clears throat> Rich young ruler came to Jesus one day. He wanted to have eternal life. He said, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. He went away sorrowful. You know, something I've learned, God will never ask you for more than you can give. And he'll never give you less than his will. He was setting that young man up for an incredible blessing. But the young man went away sorrowful. Zacchaeus was another guy. He was rich. He was powerful. He heard about Jesus. The Bible said he was short in stature. He was, he was uh, vertically challenged. And he couldn't see over the crowd he climbed up in a tree in his Armani suit. He climbed up in a tree to see Jesus. And when Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus repented. Verse 8 says, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give you half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, which he probably had, I restore fourfold. In other words, four times. That's repentance right there. I mean, that's, that's real deal. That's not just, oh, Jesus, thank you. No, that's real deal there. I mean, something changed in that man's life right there. Well, what's the difference? The main difference between these two rich and powerful men was what they valued. You see, the rich young ruler valued his earthly possessions. Zacchaeus valued the heavenly presence. There's a difference. He valued the rich young ruler more, his, his earthly possessions more. It's not wrong to have earthly possessions. It's, it's what you value. He valued them more than Jesus. Zacchaeus said, hey, I'll pay back what I've stolen four times. I'm going to, get, I'm going to help poor people. I'm, I'm going to take my resources and help people with it. And, and his life was changed. Why? Because he valued the heavenly presence. Here's another thing I see that keeps us. Keeps us. And each one of these is about a two-hour message, you know. But one of the things that keeps us from the presence of God is that little three-letter word that's almost obsolete in our, in our vocabulary today in America, sin. S-I-N. Because even in many churches today, that word doesn't even exist. The literal translation of the original word translated sin in most cases in the Bible simply means missing the mark or falling short. Sin is simply disagreeing with and disobeying God. We can make up our own set of rules, our own societal norms of behavior, our own economic responses to God. We can do all that, but if it's not in agreement with God's word, it is very simply sin. Always was, still is, and always will be. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what some popular person in the media says. It doesn't matter if our government votes to make it a law of the land that it's okay to do. It is still sin. Who would have thought in the, in the, in the late 60s, in the 70s, when I was in high school, that, that lawmakers around the country would, would, would normalize smoking marijuana? Normalize. Normalize. You know why? Because those were the people smoking it in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> now they're in power. Who would have thought in 73 that we would have normalized killing them? Innocent babies. And now we have more information to really help intelligent people say that's really not the right thing to do. And yet we have people lobbying for it. Who, 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 who would have thought? I, I could go down the list here. It doesn't matter what the government legalizes. What does the Word of God say? See, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short. That's that definition of sin. Fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin are death. In other words, this is what's going to happen. This is the payoff. This is the consequences. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That gift is what Jesus presented. 
The gift is what Jesus came. That's what Christmas is about. It's about the gift of salvation through Jesus. That's the gift that the wise men were pursuing. What will be your pursuit of Jesus in 2022? What, what, is there, is there, what's, what will hold you back? A, a lack of desire? A lack of knowing that you can? Yeah, that, that shouldn't because you already know. I mean, if you were listening, you can. Okay? We'll... we'll Will, will, will sin hold you back? Oh, there's one more I just thought of. One other thing that can be a roadblock to our pursuit of Jesus. Jesus explained it to his disciples this way in the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. When he talked about the sower sows the word, there were four different responses to it. And his disciples later said, can you explain this to us? And he did. He gave his explanation. And in verse 19, Jesus says, one of the things that chokes out the word is the cares of this world. I think we may underestimate the impact on our lives of the cares of this world. You may say, well, I, I have a desire to pursue Jesus and, and I, I, uh, I, I, believe, I believe I can. And, and you go through those hurdles, but then you have stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say stuff? That stuff happens? You know what I'm talking about? Just plain old everyday stuff that breaks your concentration, cripples your emotions, and distracts you from your focus. A fight between a husband and a wife. A phone call about your finances. The washing machine breaks down. The oven quits working while you're, while you're preparing Christmas dinner. All, all, all of those things. You get your electric bill and it's twice as much as you thought it was going to be. But your paycheck wasn't twice as much as you thought it was going to be. I mean, just stuff after stuff after stuff. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Does anybody identify with that? Does anybody ever have any cares of this world? Or you wake up on Sunday morning with congestion in your head and your voice is weak. Although it's getting stronger, I think, as I'm talking this morning. It's all right. I can still smell stuff and I still taste stuff. I'm good. All right. So, all right. It's all right. So, good. Okay. If you don't be around me, that's fine. It's all right. But I'm just telling you. Stuff. The cares of this world. I think we underestimate that as a roadblock many times in our lives. And we underestimate how the devil, how Satan uses. Not, not everything is from the devil. Okay. All right. Just, not, not everything. We just live in this world and stuff happens, okay? Stuff breaks down, stuff wears out. Things happen, it just happens. But there are some things that are, that are strategically engineered, I believe, by Satan himself or his minions to distract us, the cares of this world. Is there something you need to deal with today? Is there a care you need to deal with? Is there, is there anything of this that resonates in your heart and life that says, I, I want to get rid of this. And the way to do it is, number one, identify it. Number two, rectify it. So what, is, what do you mean rectify? Rectify means to remedy or correct. You can't correct what you don't identify. You can't fix what you can't find is broken. I was an electrician for many years and, in the underground coal mines. And it, electrical problems are some of the hardest problems because it's either, it's either out or not out. And if it comes and goes, you can never find it. You can never find the problem if it's, if it, if, if it's out some and then, then it works and then it doesn't, then it works. You, you can't find it because it's working now. And if it's out all the way, then you can, you can trace it down. Identify in your own life. As a pastor, I want to encourage you, identify. I could, I'm talking to myself too. Identify those things that are the biggest roadblocks for you. Because what's a roadblock for me may not be for you. And what's a roadblock for you may not be a roadblock for me. But identify what those things are and do what you can to rectify it. Sometimes it's just changing your schedule. Sometimes it's just changing your speech. Sometimes it's, it's praying. Sometimes it's just doing something different in your life and making a commitment, I'm all in. I don't know about you. I don't know what 2022 is going to hold. I don't know. But I know that I have an opportunity like you do to pursue him.
to pursue Jesus in a real way. Not just so my feelings and my emotions, and not just so my feelings and emotions can be impacted, but so I can experience him because it is in his presence that I am changed. From glory to glory, it's in his presence that I overcome stuff. It's in his presence that power comes for life. It's in his presence that revelation, knowledge, and understanding comes. It's in his presence that peace comes. Anybody ever need any peace in your life? We need it every day in this world we're living in, don't we? That's where it comes, in his presence. And you don't have to be in a super-duper special meeting with just the right guitar player and the right keyboard person and the right smoke coming out of the ceiling. You don't, you don't have to be in that. That's wonderful. That's fine. I love it. We have it all. I, I like it. But you don't have to be there. You can be in your home washing dishes. You can be sitting in your easy chair reading the Bible. You can be sitting on the back porch. You, 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 can, you can be in your bed propped up just worshiping God. You, you don't have to be here together. It's wonderful when we do to collectively you can pursue the presence of God. That's where David got connected with God when he was tending sheep out by himself. He became a worshiper, pursued the presence of God, and he never lost that in his life, never. Even as king, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back in, he danced before the Lord because he was so excited that the presence of God had come back into Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. That's what I want to be. I want to get to value what is most valuable in my life. And the most valuable thing is your relationship with the Lord Jesus.